Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our uh, first panel today. My name's Weaver Lilly, I'm a sophomore, and I'm on the student board of the Buckley program here at Yale. This panel, featuring George H. Nash, Gerald Rossello, and Gleaves Whitney, will focus on Russell Kirk's life and legacy. Our moderator is Lee Edwards, a distinguished fellow in conservative thought at the Heritage Foundation. Dr. Edwards serves as the chairman and was a founding member of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. He is also an adjunct professor of politics at the Catholic University of America, where he received his PhD. He also holds a bachelor's degree from Duke University. Dr. Edwards has published over 15 books, the most notable of which include biographies of President Reagan, Senator Barry Goldwater, and of course, William F. Buckley Jr. He has also written extensive histories on the conservative movement in America and of the Heritage Foundation. He has served as a fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics and was a founding director of Georgetown's Institute of Political Journalism. Again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee Edwards and our panel. How intimidating <clears throat> to follow Bradley Berzer in that absolutely brilliant and, and challenging talk about Russell Kirk. <clears throat> I can't resist sharing with you one story about, about Russell's charity. Several years ago, he and his wife Annette and a couple of their daughters were sitting down to have dinner at a restaurant in Washington, D.C. with myself and my wife and our two daughters. Our younger daughter was Catherine, totally uninterested in politics, totally. And there we were engaged in the fierce debates of the day. And poor Catherine was over there sort of drifting off, not paying much attention. And Russell was next to her. And he could see that she really was not connecting. And he leaned over and he said, Catherine, do you believe in ghosts? And Catherine, who was pretty smart, said, well, the Holy Ghost. And he said, well, let me tell you a ghost story. And he began right there, ignoring the rest of us and telling a ghost story to Catherine including her in this dinner and making it a memorable evening. And that was so typical <clears throat> of Russell to be concerned not with himself, but with somebody else. Well, I work at Heritage, uh, so therefore, we're always looking for a little, perhaps a little more practical applications of theory and philosophy and Russell Kirk. So I thought what to sort of get us started here for our marvelous panel is to point out that Russell, <clears throat> talking at where we were going, said that, well, the only way we're going to get out of the mess that we're in is if we challenge the corrupting liberal ideas that have got us here. And what are those ideas, those liberal ideas? Well, a militant secularism that places man at the center of existence and asserts that God is dead if he ever existed. A soft socialism that approves government regulation in our lives in every economic and social realm. A legalistic internationalism that insists the nation state is the cause of all conflict. A rabid egalitarianism that promises equal results rather than equal opportunities. An arrogant relativism that argues there is no absolute truth. All points of view are equally valid. And a devotion to societal, to radical societal change, modeled after the French Revolution rather than the American Revolution. So we're going to ask our panelists this afternoon to begin doing riffs on those themes. And I want to begin by introducing George Nash. <clears throat> you know, it's inevitable, George, I'm sorry, 
than in your New York Times obituary, you're going to be described as the author of the magisterial, definitive, seminal, authoritative work, the conservative intellectual movement in America since 1945. That work is indeed all those things. It's the one book we all look to, borrow from, depend on for our understanding of the origins of the American conservative movement. What is not so well known is that George Nash is also the definitive biographer of President Herbert Hoover, as well as a frequent essayist and lecturer about conservative individuals and institutions. And I recommend, among many things, his wonderful essay about the critical roles of Jews in the conservative movement. Gleaves Whitney is the director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University in Michigan, intellectual entrepreneur of the first rank. He's at ease in the age of the internet, and thank heavens that you are, Gleaves. His webcast debates on YouTube, for example, have been watched by as many as two million people in some 30 states, and he does how many, you've done, what, 190-some podcasts? Whatever a podcast is. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm told that they're very important as a means of communication. So if you want to ask a question about a podcast, Leaves is your guy. He's also the founder of the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy, which he founded. And it's a preeminent center of excellence in the Midwest served on the boards of many important res, uh, institutions like the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. And the presidential historian Richard Norton Smith has called the Howenstein Center a jewel in the crown of Michigan. Gerald Rossello is a member of one of the most distinguished law firms in America, representing clients in a variety of securities enforcement and regulatory matters. But he's with us this afternoon in his capacity as a fellow at the Jesterton Institute at Seton Hall University, editor of the University Bookman, which was founded by Russell Kirk some 60 years ago, and author of The Postmodern Imagination of Russell Kirk. No, I didn't misread that title. It does say the postmodern imagination of Russell Kirk. So that's something else that we're looking forward to, Gerald, to explaining. Perhaps we should begin, George, by suggesting out of the conservative mind and those other some 25, 30, 40 books that Russell wrote, what are the permanent things? And if you're not prepared to answer that, I'm sure that either Gleaves or Gerald will be happy to do so. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming George Nash. Uh, thank you, Lee, for that very gracious introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. It's both a pleasure and an honor to be the guest of the Buckley program this afternoon among friends old and new. And I want to thank Lauren Noble and her colleagues for inviting me to participate on this panel. Each of these are friends of mine, and we're looking forward to a very pleasant discussion, hopefully with your participation after we make our introductory remarks. In the book of Ecclesiasticus, it is written, let us now praise famous men and our fathers that begat us. We gather today to honor the memory of a famous man, a teacher, who earned his fame by interpreting those who, in an intellectual and spiritual sense, were our fathers. In the great chain of being that we call Western civilization, Russell Kirk was a sturdy link. Some years ago, a young libertarian wrote a book entitled, It Usually Begins with Ayn Rand. I do not know how many young conservatives in 2018 would say that their journey to the right or discovery that they were conservative perhaps began with the writings of Russell Kirk. Uh, 
but certainly many in this room can testify to his influence and especially to the enormous impact of his masterwork, The Conservative Mind. It is easy to sum up the historical sig significance of this book. With eloquence and conviction, Kirk demonstrated that intelligent conservatism was not a mere smokescreen for selfishness. It was an attitude toward life with substance and moral force of its own. A century earlier, John Stuart Mill had dismissed conservatives as the stupid party. In 1950, an eminent American literary critic had asserted that liberalism was, in his words, the sole intellectual tradition in the United States. After the appearance of the conservative mind in 1953, the intellectual landscape assumed a different shape. Kirk's tour de force breached the wall of liberal condescension. It struck a powerful blow at the liberals' superiority complex and at their near monopoly on the manufacture and distribution of prestige among the intelligentsia. He made it respectable for sophisticated Americans to identify themselves as men and women of the right. Above all, the conservative mind stimulated the development of a self-consciously conservative intellectual movement in America in the early years of the Cold War. Without Kirk's fortifying book, the conservative community of the past two-thirds of a century might never have acquired its identity or its name. All this was a remarkable accomplishment for a single volume by a little-known author in 1953. The magnitude of Kirk's achievement becomes even more impressive when we observe, as Dr. Berzer observed earlier, that the conservative mind was not in the conventional sense a political book. In its 450 pages, he laid out no elaborate legislative agenda. Instead, he reminded his readers that political problems were fundamentally, in his words, moral, religious and moral problems and that social regeneration was a goal which required action at levels beyond the political and economic. This is one reason why Kirk's opus has outlived the special circumstances of its birth. It focuses our attention not on ephemera, but on the value-sustaining traditions and institutions of civilized society. In an era riven by culture wars and the relentless politicization of life, he beckoned us to questions of ends and not just of means. More than any other conservative of his era, he elevated American conservatism's tone and its vision. He did so, moreover, by fearlessly grounding his conservatism in religion. For Kirk in the conservative mind, religious sanction was, in his words again, the indispensable basis of any conservative order. In an age of predominantly secular public discourse, he unabashedly spoke of the soul and of his conviction that there exists a transcendent and enduring moral order. In an age marked by the hegemony of the social sciences, he defiantly quoted poetry and wrote ghost stories with a haunting moral twist. Indeed, I can think of no conservative thinker in the past 70 years who resorted as frequently as Kirk did to the great works of Western literature to buttress his social and political commentary. Kirk was not indifferent to the worldly concerns of politics and economics. But fundamentally, he realized that political activism was not his calling. He was rather a moralist and man of letters whose vocation, as he saw it, was to remind us, in Robert Frost's words, of the truths we keep coming back and back to. The conservative mind was Russell Kirk's magnum opus. Sixty-five years later, it is in print in many languages, including most recently Korean and Japanese. For most scholars, the publication of a book of this distinction would be the culmination of a career. For Kirk, 
it was just the opening salvo. In the years to come, he founded two influential journals, Modern Age and the University Bookman, that still exist, published a column on educational issues primarily for 25 years in National Review, wrote a major biography of his friend T.S. Eliot and a classic history entitled The Roots of American Order, did more than anyone living to revive Edmund Burke as a fountainhead of conservative thought, completed a superb memoir called The Sword of Imagination, and churned out a prodigious torrent of other writings, including hundreds of essays, nearly 3,000 newspaper columns, 255 book reviews, and more than 30 books in all. A man of phenomenal productivity, he was also a man of courage who preferred unsalaried independence, as he put it, to the corrupting mediocrity of academe. In 1953, he gave up his professorship at Michigan State College for the uncertain life of a professional writer and lecturer. A public intellectual, as we might call him today, he nevertheless forsook the great cities where such creatures congregate for the relative remoteness of his ancestral home in rural Michigan. A self-styled Bohemian Tory, that was the title of his first uh, autobiography, Confessions of a Bohemian Tory, he scorned, as you have heard, such instruments of modernity as television and the automobile and found joy in planting trees, more than 10,000 of them, in and around his tiny village. Of Kirk's idiosyncratic career, it can well be said that he took the road less traveled by. No doubt he paid a price for his independence. In diminished income, he was never wealthy, and in lost prestige among the American professoriate. And yet, his labors bore fruit, as our very presence here attests. More than 30 years ago, I came across an original edition of the conservative mind in a university library. On one of its final pages, someone had mockingly written, who will read Kirk in 1984? Well, 1984 has come and gone. The Berlin Wall has crumbled, and the evil empire of Soviet communism is extinct. But the conservative mind and other writings by Kirk that helped reawaken America to its heritage continue to be celebrated and studied. They challenge us to ponder how we ought to live. In a way, Kirk's life illustrates the truth of a remark by the historian Peter Virick, who said, if you stand still long enough, sooner or later, you're avant-garde. <laughs> Russell Kirk did not stand still in his life. But on the issues that truly mattered, he stood his ground. And because he did, we, his grateful heirs, can carry on. Thank you. I am so pleased to be here. Thank you, Lauren, for all of the hard work you've done over the last few years to build this into a formidable intellectual center of freedom. It's really a privilege to be a, a part of it on this, this day, and especially with these gentlemen, all of whom I've learned a great deal from and admire. And I will try to live up to uh, the quality of this board with my brief remarks. Well. I'd like to propose a little bit of an unconventional thesis about Russell Kirk. I'd like to propose that he was a kind of fusionist. Now fusion, fusionism, is a term that's a little controversial within conservative circles for a number of reasons. Uh, in the first place, fusionism is known uh, as a, a way of pulling together
a lot of the strands of the conservative movement. You have to go back to the post-1945 world and look at what the United States was facing, look at what liberalism was doing, and look at what conservatives were doing in opposition to some of the trends in liberalism. So you had a revolt, really, against the statism of FDR. You had a revolt against the communists and the spread of communism that was occurring around the world. Think in the late 40s how much land was being taken over by communists. Say, you know, just look at uh, what was then called Red China. And also then you had creeping social engineering that would really blossom by the 1960s with LBJ and the Great Society. Fusionism was in one sense a reaction to all of these impulses coming from the left. And what fusionism tried to argue was that if the leaders of the conservative movement could find connective tissue between the libertarians over here and the traditionalists, the Catholics over here, and the anti-communists, that they could forge a powerful coalition, a big tent conservatism that could take intellectual ascendancy in this country and influence politics. This was William F. Buckley's project. Back in the 1950s, he, as editor of National Review and his associate editor, Frank Meyer, took fusionism as a way of making sure that conservatism would be relevant. It wouldn't be a route, which was, as Brad pointed out, the suggested title that Russell Kirk presented to his, his publisher, Henry Regnery, the conservative route. No, think positively. Think about the possibilities of a powerful intellectual movement in conservatism. So fusionism was an attempt to pull this off. But there was a spat, and then more of a, than a spat, a deep intellectual schism that opened up between Russell Kirk and Frank Meyer at National Review over really the, the value of fusionism in leading the conservative movement forward. I don't have time to get into all the details, but fusionism, again, is trying to take the libertarian and the traditionalist conservative and the anti-communist and other strands of the movement and pull them together in a big tent, a powerful intellectual movement that can respond to the crises that our country was facing and respond to the crises that they thought liberalism was producing. That, again, is the definition. Russell Kirk thought that the libertarian emphasis within this coalition was mistaken because so many libertarians were um, frankly godless, atheists, looked at human beings not with the dignity that Brad Berzer was just talking about, but as homo economicus, merely a consuming, a producing machine, a rutting biological species. So th this spat opened up a famous debate within the conservative movement, but I'm going to argue that the debate between between Frank Meyer and Russell Kirk notwithstanding, Russell Kirk was maybe even a bigger fusionist than even the folks at National Review and Frank Meyer realized. Here's what I mean. Take a look at his book that Brad Berzer mentioned, The Roots of American Order. Ladies and gentlemen, The Roots of American Order goes from Jerusalem to Athens to Rome to London to Philadelphia. And the founding of our civilization going back to antiquity, and finds where these traditions both grew out of each other in response to each other, clashed, and held things amid those civilizations in tension, like order and freedom in the Roman Republic, and how this argument would carry on for centuries to pull off the roots of American order two and a half millennia of history, such disparate cultures as Jerusalem with its emphasis on faith, Athens with its emphasis on reason, Rome with its emphasis on the civic polity from the republic to the empire, London with its humane synthesis of all that preceded and its, its focus on ordered liberty. To pull off such a synthesis, that is fusion because the Athenians were often seen as the font of the libertarians, for example, with the emphasis on reason and on liberty. Jerusalem is seen as the font of the traditionalist Catholics. Jerusalem along with 
Rome, both pagan Rome and Christian Rome. That's fusion to pull those together. Read the roots of American order for yourself. It's a great read. You'll enjoy it. It's a great review of Western civilization writ large. But I think you could make the case that Russell was a fusionist. A second example. Much has been made in the conservative mind when you read it that the book focuses on the pillars of order. Burke and Sam Johnson, for example, Dr. Johnson. Russell struggled with a third member that would become a troika of the roots of order, and that was Adam Smith. It took him a while to fully accept Adam Smith and the wealth of nations into a canon, as it were. But accepting he did. Now, if you, if you just look at the chronology of Kirk's writing, you see this come about. Take a look at the conservative mind, which you know, you've had a great overview of, 1953. But by the mid-1960s, the late 1960s, Russell Kirk is also reading uh, very closely Wilhelm Repke, the great economist in Europe who was saying that happiness is as important as GDP. Happiness? How do you factor something that in when you have an economist emphasizing that we're not just biological rutting organisms and we're not just producers and consumers, we seek virtue and happiness? Russell Kirk pulls these two strands together. He writes his own economics textbook, Economics, Work, and Prosperity. I've used it. It's a wonderful primer in economics. Russell came to terms with economics. It's not as though he siloed the traditionalist conservatives on one side and the economists on the other. He performed an act of intellectual and moral fusion in dealing with those. It was a remarkable evidence of his growth. I do not buy the thesis that I see in some authors of Russell Kirk that he was basically fully formed by the time he was 25, 30, 35 years old. No. I think Dr. Kirk kept growing, and I think that his way of dealing with economics and fusing it with the traditionalists, understanding that freedom has to be based, freedom has to lead to virtue. He fused these two ideas sort of at the core of the libertarian and the traditionalist tradition. A third area that I'll just say briefly that I think represents a strong act of fusion in Russell Kirk's work. Russell Kirk was always concerned and interested in why civilizations decline. He had read his Toynbee. He knew that there were some 28 civilizations, only four of them are left. Folks, that means only one out of seven civilizations lasts. We take it for granted. He didn't take it for granted. He knew that civilizations are hard-earned, a lot of work, virtue, humility, pietas, if you go back to the old Roman virtues that he loved, for example, labor, pietas. And he was convinced that if you look at the way civilizations decline, you could learn something from every one of them and apply it. And that's why we're here today, in a certain sense. Where are we in danger? of forgetting the conservative mind today. So for example, he would look at the Roman Republic on its way to becoming an empire. He would look at the fact that it fights these fierce wars against Carthage and at the same time against Greeks. And because of the shock of actually winning the wars against, Rome's wars against Carthage, the Roman Republic brings back the war booty, slaves, now that might seem, um, ostensibly, on the face of it, to be a great thing. This is the, tr the Roman triumph. And yet, by importing, bringing all of those slaves back to the Italian mainland, the prices, of course, were undercut with all those yeoman farmers and craftsmen producing their goods and services. They couldn't compete against the slaves. The slaves wrecked the economy, and this was the beginning of bread and circuses. Or as some of my students say when we teach this, you know, uh, bread and circuses is like, you know, the, what they call the bridge card or food stamps and ESPN. That undermines, it dispirits a people. We can learn something from the Roman Republic 
It led to an empire in which the distance between the individual citizen and the great center of power became so fast that that old Roman virtue of engagement with the polity, a feeling that their destiny was tied up with the greater empire, was severed. And Rome, of course, eventually falls. Russell Kirk could take you through every one of those civilizations. When the Jewish people, the Hebrews, wanted a king and quit listening to God so much, quit listening to the prophets so much, when Rome's empire got too big, when the Greeks could not get along, when the Delian League falls apart because they cannot identify a common interest, a common bond strong enough to keep themselves together, you can just go down through all the lessons of antiquity, including uh, really also when um, you, you have the problems even from the uh, English Empire, the British Empire. Russell Kirk studied all of those assiduously, and that was an act of fusion, a far, powerful act of fusion. I want to conclude just with a, a little statement out of the conservative mind, the seventh edition that Brad Berzer held up. Now, I'm going to throw the biggest fusion challenge yet out at you. I want to know what you do with this. I'd be happy to talk about this in Q&A. People forget that Russell Kirk writes the conservative mind as a way of addressing the challenges of modernity and the fragmentation of a normative culture, the fragmentation, the dissolution of our culture and our way of life. But he says this, both the impulse to improve and the impulse to conserve, improve and conserve, are necessary to the healthy functioning of any society. Whether we join our energies to the party of progress or to the party of permanence must depend upon the circumstances of the time. Of rapid change, healthy or unhealthy, we seem sure to experience more than enough in the concluding years of this 20th century. Do you hear that? This is why Russell Kirk could sit down with a progressive, an Arthur Schlesinger, and have a humane conversation. He validated, he affirmed the importance that in a free society, you're going to have a party of innovation and a party of conservation. Both are necessary. And to take Russell Kirk as a traditionalist conservative who is just de facto hostile to the progressives is wrong-headed and unfair to Russell Kirk. I think his biggest act of fusion was the compassion and the dignity with which he accorded people with whom he disagreed. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I want to thank the Buckley program uh, and Lauren and her colleagues for inviting me. Uh, this has been a real treat to have, be up on a panel with three of my intellectual heroes uh, talking about Russell. Uh, it's been, there have been a number of events with a lot of uh, great articles and conferences about Russell this year in, in his centenary, uh, for which I'm grateful since I've gotten to listen in on so many thinkers and writers that I've admired. Kirk once wrote that I've been endeavoring to steer clear of bigotry, intolerance, eccentricity, and preoccupation with the hour's political controversies, the curses of American conservatives. And I think that's a mission that continues to be important to the American right today. As uh, Gleaves and Brad alluded to, one of Kirk's canons that he wrote about in the conservative mind was an affection for the variety and mystery of human existence and thought that this was at the core of the conservative temperament. Uh, Ted McAllister, who's a really gifted interpreter of Kirk, wrote, conservatism is less ideology than aesthetics, less about beliefs than, than the imagination that orders those beliefs. Kirk understood this affection to be life-affirming, emerging out of an inherited and powerful vision about human nature and divine purpose, about life as it comes to us rather than the life that we might engineer. <clears throat> 
It is the love of a creature for the creation in which he or she participates and in the context of which they get their purpose, their reason for being. It is the joy of the spiritual outdoors, boundless, beautiful, and incomprehensible, rather than the delusion of a materialist paradise where the creature has become creator. Which I think gets to very, a very central core of what Kirk's writing and what his conservatism was, what a, was about. Now, as Lee mentioned, I'm only a lawyer. I'm not an academic or a scholar of any kind. Uh, and I want to talk today about a couple of things uh, about what I learned from Kirk and a bit of how I got to him. My, I was born in an ethnic enclave in Brooklyn in the 70s and 80s, which was about as far away from Kirk and Michigan small towns and conservative organizations or the movement as you can imagine. But I had an inarticulate understanding that my community and where I grew up and my history was important and worth defending, but I didn't know how. And in my first year of college, a group of friends and I decided to take on the task of reading the conservative mind. I was one of those students who was trying to look for a program that Brad mentioned. And I, had, frankly, had never read anything like it. It was evocative of history. Its prose was beautiful and very highly disciplined, and he had a strong conviction in a tradition. And the conservative mind really opened my eyes to that tradition in a way that I had not really known existed, and to a range of figures like John Adams, like Edmund Burke, like Arrestus Bronson, that I hadn't really known who it, that had known that existed, and, to, and they really helped me understand that there could be legitimate reasons for being a conservative and what that was. And I felt as if Kirk was speaking directly to me, despite the differences in time and circumstance. I liked that Gothic edifice that he had built, as Brad said. And recently, Jack Hunter, some, in an article some of you may have seen, wrote similarly and said that the right could use more of Kirk's basic compassion and respect for human diversity, especially among college students, where he also first encountered the conservative mind. Conservatism was not a political platform, but a way of seeing the world for Kirk. And in fact, as David Frum, who was not often a fan of Kirk's, wrote, Kirk's work is a profound critique of contemporary mass society and a vivid and poetic image, not a program, an image of how that society might better itself. In reading Kirk from college onward uh, and listening to uh, some of his lectures that he gave at the Heritage Foundation, I learned a lot of things, but I want to focus really just on a couple. The first is the power of the imagination. Kirk titled his memoir, The Sword of Imagination, and it's a theme that runs through all of his work. And in that book, in fact, in his memoir, he writes that imagination rules the world, but what kind of imagination should rule? While well, the conservative mind itself displays a kind of historical imagination that was able to knit the past together with the present in the hopes of discovering real truths of human existence. And this historical imagination is not only for nations or peoples, but for our own lives. As a fan of Russell Kirk wrote, nothing Kirk saw was simply itself. With Kirk, everything was charged with history. We are beings that move in time, approaching the future, but looking back on an increasing past. We're not unattached atoms, and then we must understand our past if we are to preserve ourselves into the future. But we must also use what Kirk called the moral imagination, which shows us where that history might have gone wrong, how it went right, and how to tell the difference. Edmund Burke, from whom Kirk adopted this phrase, writes that the moral imagination is something that, quote, the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity. It's an aesthetic and emotional, one might even say sentimental grasp first, that concept of dignity and right and wrong, only then ratified through our use of reason, understanding, and long usage. David Bromwich, uh, who wrote a book titled The Moral Imagination, again, no particular fan of Kirk, wrote that the moral imagination is much about the kind of person I am to be as it is a question of what we shall be together. The moral imagination creates a common space. It is indeed, uh, Bromwich even uses this phrase, a source of resistance. The person who sees himself as both doer and object, who asks what a given act is doing to himself and his neighbors, is less prey to an imagination heated by proselytism and war. Kirk, who, as others have said this morning, uh, valued his independence of thought and was against just about every military action or conflict in his lifetime, would have agreed with this sentiment. 
In other words, imagination protects us from ideology, which Kirk strongly contested. So tradition on this view is creative and at work of the imagination. It transforms simple historical facts into events and stories that we can make sense of. Kirk understood that we are tradition and story-making animals, and the moral imagination is what helps us to decide whether to keep certain traditions, to discard them, or to slowly modify them. As Gleave said, he was not opposed to progress at all, uh, understood in the proper way. Traditionalism, in contrast, which uses the past simply as a weapon against the present, is only a cult of the dead, and something that I think Kirk should not be associated with. The second thing I learned about Kirk was about liberalism. In short, liberalism thought, uh, Kirk thought liberalism was passing away, even in the 1960s. In an essay called The Dissolution of Liberalism, Kirk concluded that it was dying from the lack of a higher imagination. There's that word again. For Kirk, liberalism lacked any real narrative power. It could not maintain a hold on the popular imagination for long. And the reason why is because it could not judge among competing goods to tell a compelling story. Its non-judgmentalism was its death knell. Liberalism, he wrote, soon ceased to signify anything, even among its most sincere partisans, other than a vague goodwill. A liberalism embodied by endless rights and a devotion to an abstract equality and supposedly neutral principles has today, I think Kirk has proven right in this, given way to a kind of progressivism, which is animated by different visions and more troubling gods. But even that liberal goodwill is now gone and our contemporary politics is left with the temptations of Kirk's other imaginations, the idyllic and the diabolical. The idyllic imagination is what inspires all reformers. If only we could rewrite the world in our own image, all would be well. The demonic imagination is something else again. It tempts us to destroy rather than create and traps us in our own preoccupations and vices. In these differing types of imagination, Kirk saw great, the, saw great danger after liberalism collapsed. In the rise of identity politics and a racial na nationalism, in a condemnation of our own history, or pining away for some perfect past, we see the malformed parts of our imagination. Kirk calls us back to the center. In the 1950s, Kirk wrote that we live then in an insecure society, this is in the 50s, doubtful of its future, an island of comparative but perilous sanctuary in a sea of revolution. And neither the old isolation nor the old received opinions seem likely to hold against the physical force of revolutionary powers and the moral innovations of ideology. This is just such a time as commonly has required and produced in the course of history a re-examination of first principles and a considered political philosophy. I'd submit that these are not the words of a reactionary, but rather as someone who recognizes the new conditions of the world, but refuses to believe that those new conditions, uh, in those new conditions, old truths are irrelevant. Indeed, and as Lee mentioned before, I, I, think, I think Kirk had what I've described elsewhere as a postmodern imagination. He was already writing about the end of liberalism when his conservative compatriots thought it was uh, a giant that could not perhaps ever be defeated. By 1982, he was writing things like this. The postmodern imagination stands ready to be captured, and the seemingly novel ideas and sentiments may turn out, after all, to be received truths and intuitions well known to surviving conservatives. So perhaps in Virick's phrase, we are coming back around. With liberalism gone, it may be the conservative imagination which is to guide the postmodern age. That conservative imagination begins by reflecting on what Kirk called the permanent things in new, excuse me, in new ways. And Kirk thought that there could be found other modes of image and image making, which evoke compelling stories and community that could inspire loyalty and beauty rather than that age of gluttony uh, that Brad talked about. Perhaps we could have an age of redemption. Uh, and the word postmodern, of course, has been hijacked, I think, by, lot, by lots of radicals. But I found its source in 1926 by a Presbyterian clergyman wow. named Bernard Iddings Bell, who was a great influence on Kirk, who used it to, term, to call for an end of scientism, this, this materialist philosophy that thought there was no transcendence. History doesn't go forward into some kind of utopia, thought Kirk, where it will be changed into perfect humans. The, the end of liberalism, the era in which we are now living, allows us to see ourselves as we are, imperfect creatures seeking the transcendent. And Kirk, as, as mentioned before, lived that kind of search for the transcendence in his own life. And that's perhaps the third and most important lesson that Kirk gave me. 
Kirk lived in the town of his ancestors. He planted thousands of trees to renew the earth. He and his family opened their homes to refugees from the world over and lived fully in contact with their neighbors and community. Kirk liked to say that the order of the Commonwealth will only improve if we improve the order of our own souls. And we do this by creating thick webs of community and by also by recognizing that there are some webs we did not create, but to which we are nevertheless bound. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And as you can tell, we are trying to suggest in various ways that Russell Kirk does matter. He does make a difference and can be applied to the problems of today, particularly by young people. And before we go to the Q&A, if I may just say that here are three arguments that I've used with my students at uh, Catholic University, that instead of secularism, the conservative looks to a transcendent order that rules society as well as personal conscience. Instead of socialism, the conservative declares that freedom and private property are inextricably linked. Instead of revolution, the conservative says that society must change, but prudently, lest it lose what it has gained through the ages. With that, uh, we have, I think, some minutes to go. Uh, please, from questions from the audience, we have a couple of microphones here. If you'd raise, raise your hand. Somebody with you right away with a microphone. So who wants to make the first question? hesitant to adopt Adam Smith's um, theories in the Wealth of Nations early on and why he was hesitant to do that. Thank you. Uh, something about uh, how he came to terms with the Wealth of Nations? And uh, why he was hesitant at first perhaps to adopt Adam Smith's theories and if he ever Oh, fully Adam did. Smith, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you gentlemen may know more about this actually than I, but my understanding is that um, if you focus on the wealth of nations, of course, you're, you're not necessarily integrating what Adam Smith's other great work was about the theory of moral sentiments. And when you see the entirety of Smith's work as a moral philosopher, then you understand that he believed that the, the theories in the wealth of nations for, you know, uh, you know, the, the assembly line and all the things he laid out, while very mechanical sounding, actually were, was a great benefit. It, and, and the analogy, I heard Russell Kirk use it once at Piety Hill. And by the way, if you ever get the chance to go to the Russell Kirk Center in Macosta, Michigan, uh, to study there and to see the marvelous library, you should take advantage of that. But in that very building, um, I remember Dr. Kirk saying once to a group, it's like a garden. You, you know, if, if a garden is prolific, but a glutton comes out of the garden, you don't blame the garden for the gluttony. So in the same way, if the free market is producing tremendous wealth, you don't blame the, the price mechanism and the, the profit curve for greed. Uh, there's a different problem there. And I think in Russell's contemplation of virtue, that uh, he slowly came to terms with that. But I'm sure you all have very good reflections on this one, too. I would just add to that that uh, Adam Smith was a classical liberal. He was not a libertarian. And I think probably Russell at the beginning maybe thought that Adam Smith was a libertarian because he hadn't read him at that point. But the more he read him, he began to realize that he was a classical liberal and with that, he could identify and include in this fusionist approach. 
Uh, Russell Kirk started off as, uh, in, in the early 50s as what we might call a high traditionalist, uh, emphasizing uh, the importance of the wisdom of our ancestors. And some people on the right critiqued him and said, well, which ancestors? Uh, you have to have distinctions. You have to find principles. He also was uh, very much opposed to what he called Manchester liberalism, 19th century uh, liberalism and in, in emphasis on a free market econo economics in Great Britain. And uh, he again came under some attack, and I think one of the things that happens to Kirk is that he does adapt to some and respond to some of these criticisms. And so what I think he probably liked in Adam Smith was the Adam Smith, as Leif just mentioned, who combined, uh, who wrote the, on the moral sentiments as well as the, the wealth of nations. And in Russell Kirk's book on economics, a textbook, which I find the most unusual thing that he ever did, really, in the way of writing, I was surprised that late in the 1980s he wrote this for basically for high school students, the text that's still available and still in use, I believe. Uh, he wrote a defense of free market economics, but if you read it carefully, it's mixed in with his concern for, for moral foundations. And this little phrase stuck out of me, I wrote it down before coming here. Material prosperity depends upon moral convictions and moral dealings. So that was the way Kirk tried to reconcile the good in a free market and the individual opportunity it provides with the, the higher virtues that w of, w in terms of what one does with the freedom one has in the market. Mm, and Moral and Adam Smith would be very comfortable with that language. Thank you very much for your time and appreciate your discussion. I'm curious about um, what are your views concerning the future of conservatism and so we have seen in not only across America but also in college campuses across the nation as uh, being declining and also some sort of skewness or bias towards one side over the other. What's your view now on the future of that and how is that going to affect the position of the United States as the global leader of the free market society and democracy and what can be done to um, one way to curve this trend? Thank you very much. Well, let me start it out this way. Um, it's interesting to me as a historian of conservatism that we are celebrating as widely as we are in the conservative world the centennial of the birth of Russell Kirk. Uh, all sorts of conferences are going on. Uh, there's one that was held at the New Criterion the other day. There is, uh, was one out in, in Michigan uh, uh, the, uh, last month, and there's this one. There's one coming up in New York, I believe, in a couple of weeks. That's surprising to me. It seems that, uh, and it's not just formulaic. All sorts of people seem to be uh, have an urge, a compulsion almost, to write about Russell Kirk. And I would say one fundamental reason for this is that conservatism is now in a state of enormous flux, as we all know. No need to elaborate much on that. Uh, we are, it's in a stage of reconfiguration, potentially. Uh, the old paradigms have been challenged by the Trump paradigm, if you will. And so there, I think, is a felt need all over the place on the American right to try to redefine our terms, go back to our roots, to find out what fundamentals we believe in, to try to make sense of this very uh, broken landscape with all sorts of potentials for good and ill in the years just ahead. And so I think that because of that circumstance in which we find ourselves, uh, Russell Kirk is finding new readers as people try to look beyond just the, the ephemera, as I called them, to the what Kirk called the permanent things, the, the, the things that we should be striving for in our lives as moral beings. So I think, uh, without saying too much about the future of American conservatism, it seems to me it's still to be defined. And Kirk is making a contribution, perhaps unexpectedly to some of us, because of the um, travails that the right finds itself in at the present time. Yeah, thanks, George. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would agree with that. I'm, I'm actually, in part because of the renewed interest in Kirk, and in part because I think a lot of the old or older um, uh, cliches or understandings of conservatism have started to break apart in the last 10 or 15 years. I'm actually quite hopeful that uh, some of what Kirk has to say will continue to resonate. As you heard already from Brad and from the other members of the panel, Kirk never really, he, Kirk did speak about 
contemporary political topics and was not uninvolved in politics, but that was never what his major concern was. He was always concerned with how we can discern the timeless and the transcendent in our daily lives. And I think that that is what conservatism at its, at its base must start from. We, we have to know what we love, and we have to know what we have affection for, and we have to devote ourselves to those things first. And I think that's a natural inclination of people. People naturally form communities. They naturally form traditions and stories about themselves. And that's precisely what conservatism talks about. Uh, and I think, uh, in, uh, or at least at its best, and I think other contemporary ideologies sort of uh, try and do that also. I think there's a story that progressives tell about themselves in their country, and I think conservatives are looking for something similar, and I think this re-engagement with Kirk is one way of, uh, of expressing that on the right. And, and I would say, again, I'd go back to the thesis. I think fusionism has to be part of the future of conservatism. Look at the genius of our civilization and look at the genius of the conservative movement. It is the ability to hold intention the very things, the, the, the polarities that we've been talking about in tension, time and eternity, history and the permanent things. If you can hold, see, the ideologue always migrates to the simple, to, is a reductionist. It's just time or it's just eternity. That's, that's, that's ideology. Russell Kirk was against that. The conservative movement cannot survive with that. Successful conservatives will hold in tension productive, dynamic tension, these polarities that make life ironic and difficult and messy, but that's the human condition. And I thought Russell had a genius for it, and in expressing that genius, he reflected the genius, really, of our civilization, and going forward, we've got to keep that. You know, it's <clears throat> precisely at a time of crisis, in a time of chaos, that you start asking basic questions. And what better way to get to those that kind of a discussion than to look to someone like Russell Kirk, who not only looked at the last 50 years, but the last 2,000 years of Western civilization. Thank you so much uh, for coming today. My question is about fusionism, so mainly uh, to just Dr. Whitney, but um, if any of the other panelists could offer thoughts, it would be great too. Um, I'm a little confused on your usage of the term fusionism. Uh, where I first encountered it was hearing, uh, hearing it as sort of a political measure to sort of cohere irreconcilable um, strands of conservatism. So maybe you know, free market conservatism with um, social conservatism, with reactionary conservatives. Um, ideologies that, or maybe not ideologies, but uh, ways of thinking that don't really seem logically to go together initially. Um, and so I always sort of saw fusionism as a political task in itself, to make the conservative movement stronger by just saying, yeah, we can label these three things uh, conservative. Now that task of sort of seems political inherently, um, which would sort of go against a lot of the things other people have said today about uh, Russell Kirk being sort of very apolitical. Um, and Buckley himself sort of didn't like some of Kirk's statements about liberal education um, for some of the reasons that, you know, Buckley liked ideology. Buckley wanted, you know, the Yale faculty to take a strong stance against communism. Uh, it seems like Buckley would be more in favor of the sort of fusionist tendencies that, uh, that I think you're pointing to. But I don't quite see how Kirk fix, fits into that narrative. Maybe it has something to do with his transcendental moral order, I'm a little also confused about what that exactly is, that order. So any of that you could speak to? Well, it's a great question because we're, we struggle with it. Uh, fusionism by its very nature is debatable. I'm, I was just at a conference where people were arguing that fusion w really was more of a methodology than uh, substantive. And I would disagree with that. I think that it is both the methodologies. It, it's accepting the polarities between I am an individual, but I am in a community. And I've got to reconcile that tension. Or the tension, you know, I want freedom, but I respect equality, rightly understood, the dignity of everybody, every human being should be equal in, in terms of justice that's meted out by an administrative state. So you're, you're constantly struggling with these things. And again, I think uh, the, the great achievement of Russell Kirk that I personally am fascinated in, but it's not reflected in much of the literature, 
is that I think he was the biggest fusionist of all and that he was taking the philosophy and the politics, the permanent things and the expediency. And he, was, he recognized that they were a necessary tension. And so there's really, if you were to have Venn diagrams between, say, Buckley's thought and Kirk's thought, I think there's a lot of overlap there. I think if they got their cigars out and their cognac, they would, uh, or even went to the Blue Lake Tavern, they would find a lot in common. Yeah, no, I, I think Glees is exactly right. I think, I think that uh, what, at its best, what fusion does is excise the ideological temptation of either side, right? So the, indi the individualist doesn't think of themselves as a, a sort of unrelated atoms with an endless expansion of rights to be imposed upon others, but as part of a community where the community or the more traditional side of conservatism doesn't reify a particular set of social circumstances and use that to oppress individuals. And, at, and I think Kirk was trying to do a fair amount of that because he was very much an individual himself. I mean, he... he uh, <clears throat> He liked his independence, and I think was a, in something of a free spirit, but also recognized the, the bonds that we that we had with others, and I think did want to balance each of those. And you know, frankly, as a, as a person who made his living by his pen his whole life, he understood the free market, and he understood what uh, you know how uh, advantageous it could be. Um, and just very briefly on, on Buckley, since we are at the Buckley Forum, I think along with Kirk, Buckley provides another image of. Uh, an attractive image of what conservatives, conservatism could be. Even before I read The Conservative Mind, I read Cruising Speed, which is his great book about, uh, or one of his great books about boating. And it, it's attractive, and that's the kind of conservative you would want to be. It's a, it's, it is a life of obligation and joy that I think still should be at least uh, a significant part of the conservative temperament that it will make it attractive to others. I think perhaps we should add a, just a, an amendment a bit to the theme of Kirk as being um, apolitical. I, I, I think what we should say is that Kirk was interested in politics. He wrote two speeches for Barry Goldwater when Goldwater was on the verge of running for president. Uh, Kirk was um, friendly with Reagan and Nixon and so on. Kirk was the Michigan chairman of Patrick Buchanan's campaign for president in 1992. So Kirk was not uninvolved in politics, but I think the more fundamental point holds that his, his own vocation, his own teaching, if you will, was not focused on the everyday political maneuvering and so on. Uh, and so that is what I think speaks, probably speaks most to people in this audience, These, the, the, the teachings that really go beyond the, the quotidian, just beyond the, the ephemeral. Uh, also, on the freedom and virtue point, uh, the fusionism point, the debate was originally called the freedom versus virtue debate. What was the highest end of government, the promotion of virtue or the promotion of freedom? And Frank Meyer tried what was called then the fusionist synthesis, which was the government's purpose is to promote individual freedom. The, individual free, the free individual's purpose is to seek virtue. And that was the formula which not everybody felt was satisfactory, but it did seem to convey certain truths, and as was just expressed by Gerald, it was a way of keeping the ideologues on the, on far, on the far ends from going too far. You needed to be, have both freedom and virtue in a society for a society to be properly ordered. I think that would be Kirk's fundamental point. I would just add this, that uh, a phrase that Russell used frequently was, ordered liberty. And if you look at it and break it down, the idea of order would be more the traditionalist conservative. And the idea of liberty would be more the libertarian. And it would also be the individual as regards his place in, in community. So if you take and think of this constant battle which is going on between order and liberty, and the idea being with Russell that somehow coming out of that, this, this debate, this tension which is going on is going to produce the right kind of balance between order and liberty or ordered liberty. With regard to those two speeches, one of them that Russell wrote was used by Barry Goldwater at Notre Dame. And people always remarked, you know, gee, I, I we're listening to Barry speak at Notre Dame. He sounded an awful lot like Russell Kirk. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you all so very much, ladies and gentlemen.